Hey everybody, since it's December, I decided to do one of these Christmas specials because, well, everyone usually does one of these things around this time. All joking aside, or at least some of it, I didn't really want to do a Christmas special unless I knew I had something to say. I actually do have a lot of things about Christmas to say. And if you watch my show, that is the Geek Church the Show, the one that I put out you know, probably once a month uh, for now, um, you know that I like to mix a lot of issues together, and today is no exception. So today, I'm going to talk about the war on Christmas, depression. It's important you know that, okay? This isn't about the war on Christmas, so you see a lot of things about the war on Christmas. I'm not doing that. I'm going to go a different angle with this. You're going to like it. Keep tuning in. Okay, so unlike most of my shows, I did a little research. <laughs> okay, I, I do research in all my shows, okay. And uh, if you see my product reviews, that is a product of a lot of research. Anyway, many people during the holiday season, they experience major depression disorder, and it's a seasonal thing. Uh, this is a clinical depression that can appear in the late fall and disappear in the early spring. And part of this might be uh, changes in light. Uh, there's more darkness during the day, uh, not to mention the colder climate. I mean, for me, I guess I experienced this. I mean, I really hate the cold and it just reminds me of the bitterness of life. Okay, as usual, it got way too dark, uh, but I just wanna say that uh, I've had some bad things happen to me in the winter time, around the winter time, around the cold weather. So I kind of tend to associate it with that. However, the holidays tend to bring out a certain sense of cheeriness in people. And if you don't feel that, you tend to feel left out and then you feel bad. See what I'm saying? There's also this great sense of expectation. Uh, and that comes from getting gifts, sending them, wrapping them, uh, going to certain places to see relatives. Uh, which can be pretty stressful. And then there are cases where people don't have family to celebrate with during Christmas time. And that can be really sad. I consider myself super lucky that I've never really been alone on Christmas. I never really felt like I woke up on Christmas and just felt just absolutely lonely, like, like everyone had somebody to spend with. For some reason, I seem to remember always having a place to go on Christmas. Yeah, I've been fortunate to have a lot of really pleasant memories that have happened on Christmas. Uh, one of my most pleasant, I think, is the uh, Christmas that I spent uh, with my wife before we were married. Uh, we had a great time. We went to, uh, down to see relatives, stopped by to see some Christmas lights, and it was just a just a notion that um, you know we were going to get married in the summertime, and that just things were going to be really awesome for us. So when it comes to Christmas, there's a lot of great. Um, stuff on TV, like holiday specials, Christmas movies that um, I really like to watch because they remind me of how special this time is. And I want to talk about them for a little bit. I'll go ahead and start with this old favorite, The Charlie Brown Christmas, which first appeared on December 9th, 1965. So that makes it, uh, oh man, a lot of years old. And I didn't do the math. I would say that this special has really withstood the test of time. Uh, granted, the animation is pretty subpar, uh, but I don't. The basic story of it would not be improved with better animation. I feel. In other words, if you redid it uh, and just made the characters CG, I wouldn't change a single line of the scripts or anything like that. It might be nice to see just it look look a little better uh, because. That dance scene, you know, where they're all kind of doing these moves, like the one guy does the zombie dance, and they saw one of the kids doing this. You know, and Snoopy's doing his kind of thing. Uh, yeah, it looks pretty old, and it just goes on and on forever, because it's like you could tell they were trying to cut the budget somewhere. But the tune they're singing to slaps. We all know that. Wish I could play it here. Can't. Okay, sometime next year, I actually want to do um, an entire show about Charlie Brown, Charles Schultz. And the whole, let me say this uh, loudly, peanuts, peanuts. I'll put that on the screen there so you know that's not what I'm saying. The peanuts gang. Uh, but for now, I just want to talk about how the Charlie Brown Christmas special focuses on holiday depression, which is 
something that uh, might have been different back then. I'm not really certain if this was the... I, I really don't know what the landscape of Christmas specials were like. Because by 1965, there were shows that everybody watched each week. Um, you know, and there were... They probably had their version of Christmas specials and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, but... I mean, TV series having a Christmas special is done a lot. It's almost like a rite of passage for crying out loud. And um, I'm not sure if the Charlie Brown Christmas did this differently, but it certainly feels like they have. But I'm guessing that the Charlie Brown Christmas is different because it is focusing on holiday depression. And it does it from the perspective of a child. And here's the thing about Charlie Brown. He's not upset because he didn't get what he wanted for Christmas, or he's afraid he's not going to get what he wants for Christmas, which is what we usually associate children in Christmas time is. That's Those are my memories from uh, being a child at Christmas. But he just can't understand why he feels so miserable when everyone else is feeling so joyous. As a kid, I can relate a, a lot to Charlie Brown because I know what it's like as a kid when everybody around you seems so happy, but you just don't feel that way. It's just, you know, and there's a sense that you gotta blame yourself for it, but it, it's not your fault. If you're ever in a situation where everyone around you seems happy, but you aren't, um, please don't ever think that that is your fault or that there's something wrong with you. Even if the people around you are so happy, uh, think that it is. And uh, especially when they give you advice, like you need to smile more or something like that. Uh, don't, you know. It's not that you shouldn't listen to them, it's that they just don't get it, okay? So yeah, anyway, so Charlie Brown is feeling miserable and everyone seems to be giving heck on, on it. Even Linus, who's often the voice of reason on the show and is a voice of reason later in the special, because I know you've seen it, uh, tells him like, of all the Charlie Browns in the world, you're the Charlie Browniest and just stuff like that. It's like, geez, he's up, Linus. Yeah, everybody disses on Charlie Brown in this special. And usually Lucy is the one who does it first, and you know Lucy, and she's the one who basically uh, gives Charlie Brown the advice to uh, direct the Christmas play, because I guess they were going to have the rehearsal, but they didn't have a director. I'm not really certain how this politics works here. Anyway, so I guess that's supposed to allow Charlie Brown to find the true meaning of Christmas. And it's interesting that in this uh, Christmas play that they're doing, which is never seen, uh, and then presumably done in a public school, it is um, the story of the Christmas play that they're doing is the one of Joseph and Mary and uh, no room at the end because there's an innkeeper and his wife in this play. That's what we know. Um, and there's a shepherd. Um, so yeah, this is the uh, traditional Christmas story, the nativity story. So well, during this rehearsal, um, nothing's really going right for Charlie Brown as usual. And this time it's not his fault. I mean, his team is just kind of distracted they're doing that dancing all the time and uh and i remember that scene where he just throws down his microphone or not i'm sorry not microphone megaphone uh which probably should have broken or something like that anyway um it's decided during this time that they need a christmas tree which is really strange because they are actually doing a nativity story and i'm not really certain what you would even need a christmas tree for something like this uh, then again i believe that is actually the point uh, so when Charlie Brown goes to get a Christmas tree, um, all that he sees are just a bunch of like the aluminum Christmas trees. And he spots this one organic looking tree, which is no more than a twig. And when he brings it back, what happens? They gang up on him and laugh on him. Even Snoopy does. I mean, seriously. I mean, jeez. I mean, he boos him when he shows up there too. Come on, that that's there. You can't ignore that. That happened. Anyway, so when Charlie Brown asks what's Christmas all about, Linus reads a section from the book of Luke uh, relating with a traditional nativity story, which is very beautiful, actually. And um, I'm surprised that this special aired as long as it did, because uh, there are some people that would be offended by that, the idea that just saying, yeah, Christmas is all about uh, that kind of that biblical story. And yeah, it's, that special doesn't really air on, um, on television anymore. I think the only place you can see it now is Apple TV. I actually believe PBS uh, ran the special, um, but they've stopped doing it. So. Now, if I were a different kind of uh, YouTuber or something like that, I'd probably say that the loss of Charlie, the Charlie Brown Christmas on regular network television is another sign of a last battle in the war on Christmas. 
but I'm not. But I will get to that because I just kind of in the title here, so and maybe that's what you tuned in to see, so. Hmm. Anyway, you all know the story when Charlie Brown thinks, oh, I'll just decorate the tree and it'll look great, but when he tries to do it, he kills it. Well, in actuality, it just kind of bends over. That, I mean, the trees that you get, no matter what, they are dead, okay? So uh, technically, he killed nothing. It's interesting, though, that when everybody gets together and they start singing, when they start putting the uh, decorations on the tree, it somehow miraculously grows. Um, there's definitely something supernatural going on here, but it isn't really addressed, nor does it need to be. Uh, perhaps the whole point of the special is that when we all come together and, and show our love, um, they change for the better. Yeah, that's what it's trying to say. Now, I have no idea if this was like the intention. And honestly, when you're writing a story and when it comes to theme, I actually believe theme is something that grows organically out of the story. And if you start your story with, I'm going to teach about this, then your story becomes propaganda. So the fact that it sort of went to that is great. And the fact that at the end when the, the Peanuts gang sings and then Charlie Brown sings along is just glorious. And yeah, I just, I can't help but just uh, get tears when they start singing the heart the Herald Angels sing. It's just awesome. So anyway, you heard my interpretation of this theme, but I think a lot of Christian people want to say that the point of the special is how to address how Christmas is steered away from its original Jesus slash Christian roots. I think that is a lazy takeaway. I think just because something has strayed away from its original roots and may have some, become something all different altogether, that doesn't mean that that is a bad thing. In fact, most Christian scholars will tell you that the whole nativity story, even as far as it's told in the Bible, due to certain translations, the whole no room at the end probably didn't happen in that way. At least not in the way that the Charlie Brown kids were presumably going to present it in their play. And not everyone believes the nativity story as it's written in the Bible. And it is a big pill to swallow, and I don't expect anyone to do it just like that. And I think it's uh, callous to think that we should, that everyone should believe that. Um, you know, and what happened on Thanksgiving is probably not what really happened. Uh, as I mentioned in last, uh, last month's, uh, episode, it doesn't even get me started on Halloween. I mean, I don't even know how that started and how it becomes what it has become, but I'm glad it has. I think it's great that we have a holiday that is celebrating, uh, this idea of a savior coming into the world and the songs that it has inspired, such as uh, Joy to the World, All Holy Night, and the aforementioned Hark the Angels, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, are awesome, and they deserve to be celebrated, and they deserve to be sung again and again and again. They convey a spirit of joy that I think everyone needs, and I would say if you're feeling joyful, I don't know if it matters where it comes from, but uh, one could justify a lot of sadism with that. But uh, basically I'm saying like, shoot, I mean, I'm not, if somebody's happy with something and they're not hurting somebody, I'm gonna let them be happy in that. I mean, one of my favorite uh, songs from Christmas is called Mary's Boy Child. It's by a group called, I think it's Bonnie M or Pony M. I really should look up pronunciation. I can't play the song here for you. Just do a search on YouTube uh, for the video because the song is really great. And um, man, I remember one year uh, I was just dancing that and just feeling so good. And uh, I should, man. It's Christmas. Okay, now there's some who say like uh, removing Christ from Christmas uh, makes everything empty. And so some will refuse to say like happy holidays or season's greetings because of that because they want to hear Merry Christmas. They want to hear that Christ part. And this doesn't take into account that I think people feel legitimate joy at Christmas time that has really nothing to do with the whole belief in the uh, Christ story, the nativity story. And besides, it's Christmas isn't the only holiday that's celebrated around this time. I mean, there's Kwanzaa and Hanukkah. And uh, unless Christians want to claim that Christmas is the only holiday, I think Happy Holidays uh, is quite appropriate of a greeting. Uh, should 
those that revere these holidays not be allowed to feel some joy themselves? I mean, should those that celebrate uh, Kwanzaa and Hanukkah and not Christmas not be allowed to feel joy? Come on, you don't have the monopoly on it. I've mentioned this several times on this show, but I am still a believer of Christ. And in spite of the huge amount of hypocrisy that Christianity has done in the past two millennium, uh, the issue is that I don't really believe in the Christianity that um, has taken kind of the Bible, in a lot of cases, the spirit of the Bible kind of way out of context and from what has historically happened. And I've said before that I've seen what this loosely based organization has done in the name of God and it is not as good as they would like to believe that it is. So if Christian people are insisting that you have to be praising Jesus in order to be celebrating the holiday, maybe it's the Christians who are the party poopers here. Hmm? So yeah, I think there's something about Christmas that will always have that otherworldly joy, for lack of a better term. Maybe we just can't explain it, but it's just there, just like Charlie Brown. Uh, it would just ruin it if you tried to explain like why that tree grows. Hmm? I mean, here's another Christmas special that's uh, somewhat related. You know, if you know the story of how the Grinch stole Christmas, then you know it's another example of somebody living alone and suffering a lot of depression during the holidays to the point of hating them. Absolutely hating them. Uh, since the Grinch is miserable, he believes the only solution is just inflicting more misery around him so the rest of the world matches his mood. Uh, now, in the original book, it isn't really known why he hates Christmas. Maybe his heart is too size is too small. I'm certain that the movie versions have actually tried to explain this, uh, but explanation of the proper motivation isn't really needed to tell this story. So, when the Grinch uh, steals Christmas, tries his best to destroy it by pretty much taking all the Christmas ornaments and trees and presents, throwing them off a cliff, and what happens? Maybe Christmas doesn't come from the store. Maybe Christmas means something more. And it still does. The sad part is that as a kid, I mean, I associated with Christmas with getting stuff. Like it's this one day of the year that we can get what we want as opposed to those sucky other days because let's face it, life can be very painful sometimes and you don't always get what you want when you want it. And sometimes you get deprived of things. Do I need to even go into more detail about how uh, life can be terrible sometimes? In a way, I think it just as a kid, I feel like, man, just for this one day, can you just make it up with me with toys or something like that? So I had the Sears uh, wish book. It used to come in the mail, and man, I loved that. It was so it was full of all the, all the new toys. I used to circle the ones I wanted, and I even like tried to uh, get, like I tried to like, um, like if some relative asked me what I wanted for Christmas, I like I practically had a chart of like who's getting me what uh, for the holidays. You know, I had this whole racket going. It's uh, <laughs> a lot of us learned this as kids to be little businessmen like this. It's it's kind of a shame, really. And yeah, as a kid, I just had the visions of the sugar plums dancing in my head as uh, having just visions or, or fantasies of just people just handing stuff to me, just presents after presents. And I have to say that uh, just the giving of something isn't necessarily love. And just giving something a material item isn't really the best expression of it. I mean, I think we all know that. And I hate to say it, but a lot of the uh, good Christmas memories I had uh, were because I got what I wanted. Um, like, there was this uh, toy, there was always one, one toy that I really wanted when I was a kid. Uh, one year it was the Death Star Space Station, the Kenner Star Wars toy, because I love Star Wars toys. And when I finally got it, I think someone snapped a picture of me uh, after I had run wrapped it. And there's a definite smile on my face, but I feel like that kind of happiness you feel, that smile, is just kind of, it's not joy. It really isn't. It's just not, uh, you know, when you get what you want, you might feel content, you might feel even happy, but you don't feel joyous, do you? All right, since I'm talking about other Christmas movies, uh, I might as well talk about the film Jingle All The Way, and uh, yeah, I don't really 
like this film, um, but uh, some people think it's a holiday classic, and it has the elements of it there. I definitely think there's uh, something to the story where Arnold Schwarzenegger is trying to find this toy for his kid because it's really just a makeup for the fact that he's never there for him for the rest of the year. And uh, a lot of parents kind of have this mentality, like, um, like if I get my kid this toy, then then they'll love me because I haven't been there for the rest of the year. So Christmas is this big makeup time. And um, I don't really like how the story really wraps up, but I will say it's definitely ahead of its time for Iron Man and the MCU because it just boils down to two superheroes fighting. And um, I kind of feel like this film is trying to make a statement on how we uh, how we view the holidays, and um, but I don't really think it's smart enough to go that far. Uh, While well, I'm talking about um, holiday classics that I think are overrated, uh, I might as well uh, talk about A Christmas Story. And if you aren't familiar with this film, it essentially boils down to a kid who wants a BB gun for Christmas and then gets it, like in the eye. Get it? Because he shoots his eye out. And yeah, I know a lot of people that love this film. I even know it flopped when it first came out. Uh, I think the mid-80s VCR boom kind of made people rent this one a lot, especially around the holiday season. And then it just played uh, nonstop on, uh, on channels during the holidays. And I think this film uh, isn't really about Christmas, but it's kind of about being a kid at Christmas. So, okay, I guess it is about Christmas. But I guess just um, there's something about it that... Uh, that there are a lot of uncomfortable moments from my own childhood that feel, I feel like are being represented in the Christmas story, and I just couldn't laugh at it. I really couldn't. And, um, you know, it's like the film kind of wants me to laugh at this, but it never could. But, uh, hey, if you like a Christmas story, I'm not saying you should you should hate it. Um, I could do easily, um, and I've thought about doing a, just to get some views about a, you know, about oh, I hate the Christmas story. Well, it turns out like everyone else has kind of done that. So I don't think that, uh, I really don't think I'd be able to add to that much. So that's my two cents on that. Okay, but there is one holiday movie which I truly love, and that's It's a Wonderful Life. And with the premise of George Bailey going through a hard time because uh, his savings and loan, Uh, All Savings Alone kind of went under in 1989 due to a scandal with them, so it's... uh, That part of the film doesn't really age well. But anyway, um, somehow he misplaces $100,000, which at the time, that was probably a lot more money than it is. That would would be now. And uh, just... Was that $100,000? It was a a, a big sum of money. Even even now, I think you wouldn't just carry around this big sum of money, but uh, yeah, they did, and his friend lost it. Yeah, he did. Yeah, what happened uh, wasn't even George's fault, but he knew he was going to get blamed for it. And um, and then it comes to the point where he's he wants to commit suicide, and it gets very, very dark. And and then the angel Francis that he meets gives him the ability to see what life would have been if he had been never been born. And um, I wonder what he was actually thinking made this wish on this bad day. I mean, was he hoping that he would just be eradicated from existence, not even remembering um, the memories that he had? Well, I'm sure you don't remember how the film is done because, yeah, this this story has been done in several uh, media. And I think it's strange that he was so willing to sacrifice the joy he had right there just for so he wouldn't have to face um, the misery he was going to uh, face, which I have to admit does seem pretty bad. I mean, he could have faced some jail time for uh, this kind of stuff he was going on, but um, you know, there's, there's ways to get around those sentences and stuff like that, but eh. Well, unfortunately, as uh, George finds out that um, not only had uh, uh, he had not made his entire life around him worse, he had actually made it better. So all the good that he had uh, brought to the town had simply been eradicated, and uh, the bad guys essentially won in his life. Now, I always love the idea that is expressed here, which is that all of us are brought in the world for some for some good reason, for some good purpose, and that by eliminating that, it somehow just sort of throws the world out of balance. I remember that I was uh, sharing with a certain uh, pastor 
uh, that how I really liked this story. And, um, and they mentioned how much they hated this movie, that it was humanistic. And personally, if humanistic is saying that every person isn't garbage, but has a meaning and purpose that they can add to the goodness of existence, then you can call me a humanist. If anything, most Christians love to use the whole, you have a purpose as an evangelism tool. So I think there's something to learn from this film. Of course, when I'm thinking about this film, I always think about this really funny episode of Married with Children. I didn't really watch this show much, but I did catch their Christmas special called It's a Bundleful Life, uh, which shows the kind of the opposite of, uh, of the tropes in the uh, It's a Wonderful Life movie. In this one episode, an angel is played by uh, the late Ken, Sam Kinison. Uh, yeah, uh, he died like shortly after this was made, maybe a few years later. Uh, if you're not familiar with Sam Kinison, he was a famous comic that, comic that had a lot of yelling in his, uh, in his delivery. And um, he shows uh, Al Bundy what the world would be like if he had never been born. Well, instead of his family uh, being non-existent, um, yeah, for some reason, I think he had his kids. I don't know how that happened. Uh, but essentially, his wife, Peg, is married to someone else, and their children are absolutely, wonderfully happy and in love with each other. And so the angel has to basically say, I was trying to show that the world's uh, better off with you in it, but I failed. <laughs> And then, and of course, the takeaway here is that, you know, Al is pretty selfish and that uh, he actually just wants to go back to how it was just so he can, just despite the family that he saw in his vision. And uh, I can't think of that this uh, special is really mean-spirited, but I, I can't help but just, just laugh at it when I saw it. it was, it's just funny. Anyway, the film It's a Wonderful Life just reminds us that life is full of problems, but it has places where joy just rolls, okay? That exists. Yeah, they might be in the minority. Who cares? They're still there. I mean, I'm going to have to say it. I've had times in my life that it's just been full of sorrow, and it just felt like, ah. And uh, here's the thing. You stumble along into the, in the dark long enough, a little bit of light really helps, doesn't it? And sometimes that little bit of light is just what we need to find our way. And sometimes that situation that we think is so bad, if we just hold on a little bit longer, it'll work itself out. And yeah, we might have to throw in some work here too. Yeah, and I can't help but think of one of my other favorite films, Die Hard. Yeah, I'm not really one of those who believes that Die Hard is a Christmas movie. Uh, it just is a film that happens to take place uh, during Christmas um, and some films just as long as I, I consider a Christmas film as in Christmas is the central part of the story so anything dealing with Santa Claus or anything like that I usually count that but if it's Christmas is just the time that it's that the film is taking place in I usually don't count that as a Christmas film but if Dyer is a Christmas film so are these films Oh yeah, you're really going to try and hit the pause button so you can find your favorite Christmas film on there, right? And then leave a note in the comment. Hey, while you're doing that, can you like and subscribe? That'd be awesome. Anyway, I've talked about how Die Hard is in the list of my favorite movies, and why shouldn't it be? I mean, there's that one scene that would be just great alone, and that's the scene where uh, John McClane is at the top of Nakatomi Tower, and he knows the, the roof is about to explode, and he's forced to tie a fire hose around his waist and then jump off. So that's enough to kind of be like a, a makeshift bungee cord as the as it, everything explodes uh, behind him. And then he, I guess his plan was to sort of like swing in and then break the glass, but the glass won't break. And he's like stepping on it with his bloody feet because he had stepped in glass earlier. <laughs> so, and then he has to like push off and then uh, shoot the glass and then break through it. So going through more broken glass. And then the thing that he tied himself to, the big metal wheel that the fire hose falls down and is starting to drag him down. And so he barely gets it off in time. For me, I love action scenes like that, where one thing escalates to another thing, then escalates to another thing, and then escalates to another thing. But you have to have 
a time where that scene kind of ends, then it moves on and does something else. Uh, but sometimes life is like that. You just get out of one frying pan only to get into some fire, then uh, get out of that fire only to get into some, I don't know, something else that isn't a cliche. Like I said before, life can be a lot. It can be very overwhelming. And it's nice to get a break sometimes. And yeah, Christmas is one of those great times to have a break. I mean, thank God most of the companies that uh, do take the day off. And I appreciate anybody who does work on Christmas. Ah, yeah, because life can be pretty hard at times. And speaking of hardship, the one special that seems to show up all the time is, of course, A Christmas Carol. And I don't actually told that this story kind of got popular because it used to be popular to tell ghost stories around the holiday. So that's more like a Halloween thing, really. Now, I've never actually read the original version of the story, but um, I've seen so many versions of it that I feel like it. Remember I'm watching a movie that has that's based on the Christmas Carol? It's like watching a Superman, Batman, or Spider-Man film, you know, where it's just like, you've seen the story told and retold so many times, it's not really like you're enjoying it. It's just this, it's almost like this little check list that you're checking out the highlights. And, and sometimes you might go, oh, they did that, but that's a clever twist on that. Yeah, it feels the same way with the Christmas Carol. I'm wondering who they get to say Scrooge and how well he's going to do the bah humbug and... Then Marley shows up with all the other ghosts based on various periods of Christmas. There's that one scene in the, the Ghosts of Christmas uh, present is showing Scrooge his nephew Fred and they're playing some game at this party. And I swear every version I've seen, movie version, they always, they always play a different game at this thing. It's always, yeah, the game's always different. This concept is weird, you know, about the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future. I can't help but think that the ghost of Christmas present kind of has the easiest job because he's only got to deal with the Christmas that's, like, there. You know, then there's the other ghost, like the ghost of Christmas past has to deal with all those Christmases of, uh, that have gone before. And I'm, you know, this is, I mean, assumingly only they're, like, the cutoff point is, like, before the birth of Jesus, right? Because it's Christmas, I, I guess. I don't know. When did that ghost start their job? And also, that ghost of Christmas future. Do they see all the Christmases of the future? Like, do they know when the last Christmas is? Like, do they know, like... He's probably seen the Mad Max or the day after a Christmas special or something. <laughs> anyway, these ghosts literally scare the hell out of Scrooge. And he becomes a better person. And uh, that feels like a, a Christian thing right there. Because if you know anything about how Christianity operates... It's about telling people they're going to go to hell and then telling them they can change. And I've actually heard that there's a version of this story called A Christian Christmas Carol, because why wouldn't there be? And um, I did a Google search and I couldn't find out if there's like an official version of this play. Um, but considering that Dickens' works are public domain, it's... I mean, it doesn't surprise me that there's no definitive version of A Christian Christmas Carol any more than there's a definitive uh, version of uh, A Christmas Carol other than its original source material, the book. Yeah, and I think in the Christian Christmas Carol one, Scrooge is visited by three angels instead of ghosts, which isn't much of a change uh, unless there's some sort of altar call at the end. And if it's a Christian production, you better believe that they've, they've got one ready to go. I kind of feel like the Scrooge story is a, uh, is a very good one of redemption. Uh, but it's not, it's not because he realized he needed a savior, but that he needed to be a savior to those around him. After all, Scrooge's greed caused him to become the most hated man in the town. And when the angel, ghost, spirit of Christmas future yet to come shows him his grave... He knows exactly the name who's on it. There's always a scene of drama where he has to scrape off the stone and see his own name, but he knows who's on that stone. And it's it's not that he's upset that he's passed away. I mean, he he's, he's in the future. He knows that's eventually going to happen. Um, and he doesn't seem to be interested in looking at the year on his grave. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if I saw that, I'd be like, oh, what year does this happen? Just to see how much time I got left. What distresses him is a scene that happens previously where he sees all these people essentially happy that he is gone. Like they're just going through his stuff and probably very glad that they don't have to pay any uh, past debts on him, honestly. Well, at least that's what it showed in The Muppet Christmas Carol, which is easily my favorite version of the story. And 
might be my favorite Christmas film of all. Um, there's just something about the story that achieves a level of drama that most films don't have. And if you know anything about the Muppets, they do every good third film, I guess. Every other Muppet film is somewhat good. And they're always funny, I would have to say. But uh, this was the first motion picture that the Muppets did without Jim Henson. And it felt like it was going in a different direction. Like, most of the humor comes to the uh, fourth wall breaks, which is very, um, that's very Muppet-oriented humors. Uh, fourth wall breaks happens a lot. Uh, and Gonzo seemed to be like the main Muppet since they replaced uh, the Kermit voice actor. And, uh, yeah, it was a weird time. Anyway, so yeah, there is that scene in the Muppet Christmas Carol where you see uh, people being joyous that Scrooge is dead, and Scrooge just wants to see some place where that isn't the case. And that's when they show that Tiny Tim has died, and the Muppet Christmas, the Muppet Christmas Carol really went that hard. And you can see the pain of Kermit and Miss Piggy as they play the Cratchits here, and, and they've lost their son. And you can see them holding back tears. And, uh, it did not have to go this hard. It did. But what is great is that Scrooge is saved, and, uh, that's the words the Muppet Christmas Carol used. Uh, you know, that scene where Scrooge opens the window, and Gonzo and Rizzo are knocked out. Still pretty funny. Uh, and his new life ensures that Tiny Tim doesn't die. The fact is that Scrooge's redemption led to saving a life from an untimely death, and that's the happiest ending you could ever know. So yeah, the truth is, I still believe in redemption. I still believe you can save lives, because what can I say? It's Christmas. And if you can save a life from an untimely death, that's the best gift you can give to someone. Okay. So yeah, even though The Muppet Christmas Carol is my favorite movie, I want to talk about uh, another Christmas movie that I would have to say, yeah, I'm going to say that the, uh, this is, is a Christmas movie, Home Alone. Now yeah, this film is most remembered because uh, Macaulay Culkin dealing with those inept burglars, you know, where they just kind of walk into those traps. It's funny once. Okay, fine. It's still funny. But uh, you feel the pain. <laughs> I swear, I think I feel the pain more when I watch it. But the scene that is, I most remember, is the scene where uh, Kevin McAllister is in the church and he sees the old man from across the street, the one that he's been fearing for, uh, uh, during the entire film. At the time, uh, Kevin thinks this guy's some murderer, thanks to some uh, urban legend that has been happening about him. It becomes very apparent in the first few seconds when Kevin actually sees him at church that he realizes that this isn't the case and starts to talk to him. There's something very sincere in the way that these two deliver their lines in that scene. And part of it is just the actor that plays the old man that I didn't look up, but uh, shoot, he probably deserved an Oscar for that if he didn't get it. And the other is just Macaulay Culkin is just trying to give him the best advice he can, which, you know, he's a kid. He's not going to give really good advice. And there are many times where he just... And there are many times in the film of Home Alone where... Uh, Kevin McAllister is trying to talk like an adult, and I think he mostly succeeds most of the time. When you're a kid, you try and do that. You try and talk like an adult, and sometimes it works, but for the most part, you're still a kid, and people still see that. And, um, and by that time in the movie, Kevin had been given that wish that to make his family disappear. He, he had it come true, and he experienced all the, all, the, all the good times of that that he thought he would, but now all he just wants to do is just get him back because he realizes he just can't have this permanently. And it's sad that the old man in this scene really has no one else he can talk to and uh, he can confide in Kevin for some reason. And yeah. And he also, it's also weird that he says going to church is where you go when you feel bad about yourself. Yeah, that's one part of the film that uh, hasn't really been dated, is it? It's funny to see Kevin give him some advice that is actually very good about uh, overcoming, that the old man should overcome his fears, talk to his son, just so he can talk to his granddaughter. And he's just applying a lesson that he learned from his basement, that he used to fear it and he just doesn't anymore. He just learned to overcome it. He hopes that the old man can do it. There's something about the scene that I think works because it shows how important it is to come together during holiday times. 
and just share what's going on. And it's sometimes during that sharing that we really help each other without even trying. After all, like I said before, life can be tough. I mean, it's so bad that we hurt each other even without even really trying. We hurt each other by accident so many times. If you really think about it, much of what we do is out of complete ignorance. We don't have no idea that we're doing this thing, that we're doing it. And if we hurt each other without trying because we're ignorant, maybe we need to become the opposite of that so we can help each other. Because if we can save lives, isn't that the most important thing we can be doing? Okay, this will be the last episode of my show, that is the Geek Church show, for the year. But I'm probably going to be able to squeeze in a few product reviews uh, before 2024, because I'm still getting stuff sometimes. But I'm really looking forward to the first uh, full week in January, where I'm going to be headed to Las Vegas for CES. And then my next show, that is the next episode of the Geek Church the show, is going to focus on CES 2024. And that will be very probably going to be one of my longer and more in-depth shows. It's also going to take a heck of a lot of planning, so oof, and I'm getting tired just thinking about it. For now, this has been Mark Rollins from the Geek Church signing off, wishing you a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Seasons Greetings, however you say it. Just have a good time. <laughs>